I am Marin Carpenter. I'm the Field Operations Specialist at uh, King Conservation District. So I oversee KCD's Native Plant Nursery, assist in coordination of KCD's annual Native Plant Sale, and work with KCD's planners and crew members to get restoration and enhancement work done along the shorelines of King County. This presentation tonight will cover countless benefits that native plants provide for landscape aesthetic, wildlife habitat, and water quality. And we'll go over finding the right plant for the right place, determining your conditions, uh, plant stock types, and native plant characteristics. All righty. So we'll just dive right in. Um, why use native plants? So native plants provide multiple benefits within your landscape. Uh, water quality benefits increased habitat for native wildlife, and they provide a unique landscape aesthetic. And I'll go into more of those details on the next slides. So for water quality, plants help to improve water quality, just sort of generally. Um, they prevent erosion, absorb water, uh, before it runs off into water bodies and helps to filter out pollutants. In a natural area, on, on my left side of the screen, um, you can see it's sort of a natural area and it has about 50% infiltration of uh, stormwater compared to 15% in a more urban area, uh, which is due to many of the roads and buildings uh, being impervious surfaces. And then 10% of water runs off in a natural setting uh, compared to 55% in a more urban one. So next one here, we have another reason for water quality. So oftentimes our native plants can do a better job at maintaining or improving water quality. Since they're well adapted to the area, they tend to be able to grow deeper roots uh, with more fibrous pieces and they can improve stormwater infiltration as well as prevent erosion, which is a water quality concern. Uh, next, we're going to go into uh, native wildlife. So native animals have evolved alongside our native plants. Many are dependent on each other to thrive. Planting native plants in your yard will mean providing more space for wildlife to enjoy the yard and for you to enjoy the wildlife. Native plants are especially important for insects that support our food webs, but many insects, including caterpillars, are specialized to only eat one to several species of native plants, and many caterpillars can't eat invasive species at all. Caterpillars are an especially essential part of the food web for songbirds. Uh, many songbirds rely on protein packed and easy to digest caterpillars to feed their chicks. So here I have a picture that I actually took at our nursery and these are uh, likely dark eyed juncos. Uh, juncos eat seeds, berries, and insects throughout the year, but while they're raising their babies, they switch to a diet that's almost entirely composed of insects. They can require thousands of caterpillars, grasshoppers, beetles, and more to raise and fledge one nest of chicks. Urban and suburban backyards with lots of native plants can attract three times as many native birds to visit and nest. In general, you can best support wildlife by planting a wide variety of native plants. And next here we have lowlands and landscape aesthetic benefits. So our native plants not only provide water quality and wildlife benefits, but they also are beautiful and provide a regionally distinct feel uh, that is indicative of the area we live in. Uh, and I always encourage people to embrace that look of the Pacific Northwest rather than to fight it. So when you're planting your yard, we want you to think in layers. Uh, you will provide the most erosion prevention, water quality, and wildlife benefits by layering your plants. Having trees, shrubs, and a ground cover layer means that rainfall will be intercepted in many places on its way down. Uh, and this means there will be less runoff and more stormwater infiltration. 
less runoff can also mean less erosion taking place. And if you have layers in your landscape, you will also provide better habitat for wildlife because you have provided more shelter and more food options that last throughout the year. So when we're talking about native plants, you might ask like native to where, what does that mean exactly? How broad? Uh, so when we're talking about native plants here today, we're talking about plants that are native to the Western Washington area, but specifically the area I'm referring to with most of these plants that you're gonna learn about today, it's the lowlands. That's the area that's sort of nested in between the Olympics and the Cascades in the lower lying, uh, lower elevation area. So when you're looking for native plants, you wanna look for plants that are from this area or if you're joining us from somewhere else this evening, uh, you'll want to look at what's your like sort of regional distinctive area and then look for plants from within that zone. And native plants can be from, they can be from all over. So some of our plants um, are from, you know, Western Oregon and Western Washington, and they kind of transcend that boundary. But you won't always see something, say, from Eastern Washington and Western Washington, and those won't both be native to this area because um, we have very distinctly different climates. Um, some plants, but not all, will transcend both sides of our state. So we have our native plants, but on the flip side, we also have many invasive plants. Uh, and these are just a few of the species that you might see in your own backyard. These are very common uh, species to, to see in, in people's yards. So we're going to go over them first. Many invasives started out as seemingly harmless and were selected for their beauty, but now have run rampant. So invasive non-native plants have many features that allow them to outcompete our native plants. One such feature is a highly successful reproductive method. So like butterfly bush uh, that you see here on the right side, um, they're a single flower, just one of those little stems, can produce 40,000 seeds. And those seeds can be dispersed by wind, occasionally by water, by animals, and they get everywhere. That's why you see butterfly bush everywhere. Uh, but butterfly bush isn't actually as wonderful, although it's beautiful as we would hope it would be because it doesn't support uh, caterpillars. It only supports butterflies and we have a whole life cycle to work through. So um, they're not as beneficial as we'd hope they would be. Um, and then on the other side here, we have some ivy, some laurel and some blackberry and all of those um, spread and reproduce using or using mostly berries, but they can also just like break off and grow a whole nother plant. Um, and so many birds will eat those berries. Uh, ivy actually has berries as well. And when they eat those berries, birds don't destroy their seeds. That would be lovely, but instead they digest them. They give them a little like fertilizer packet and deposit them and they grow and germinate even with more ease. And so many of these species are still sold as landscaping plants despite the damage that they do. Um, and using native plants can help prevent the propagation of invasive plants and can help avoid new invasives being introduced. So while you decide what you would like to see in your yard, you'll first need to consider what will thrive in the area you have. The type of soil, how it holds water, the sunlight availability. We'll start briefly with a discussion of the geologic history of the Puget Sound since it has impacted the soil, the water, and the sun availability. So glaciers have had a huge impact on the soil of our region. About 14,000 years ago, the area most of y'all are probably joining me from uh, this evening used to be under about half a mile thick of ice. 
Uh, this was known as the Puget Lobe of the Cordilleran Ice Sheet. This glacier is responsible for carving out the Puget Lowlands. So as you can see sort of on the left side, that entire area that's blue is what was covered in ice. This glacier carved out that section and created the Puget Sound, uh, the, like all of the Puget Lowlands have been created based off of this scoring that's happened with the glacier moving uh, like down and then receding. Um, and so for the purposes of this talk today, it did three things. It created a hard pan, which is basically a very compacted layer that serves as a sort of impenetrable layer. Uh, it left glacial outwash and it formed post-glacial river deposits of accumulated like, mucky soil. So this picture here is a glacier that's actually in Canada um, and moving across, uh, so it's moving across the landscape there. And as it moves, it pushes soil out in front of it. So you can see that area that's in the red circle there, that's soil that's been sort of scored out and pushed along as the glacier moves. And that area in the red is called the glacial outwash. This outwash is very well drained and has a tendency to be droughty in the summer. This sort of material makes up the majority of the hills around the Puget Sound and is left over from previous glaciation. So this is sort of what that, that soil looks like. Um, you can see it's very sandy and rocky and therefore dries out really quickly during the summer. And then on the flip side of that, those glaciers also, when they carved out that lower lying area, um, they left behind these braided rivers. And those rivers, as they fill and flood the surrounding low lying areas um, and then sort of recede back into their channel, they deposit a lot of sediment. And that sediment is very um, sort of mucky, but very fertile soil. So then next one, we have sun. So here in this picture here, you can see sort of one side of the hill versus the other side of the hill. And they're having very different, different situations, very different amount of sun. Um, and so, you know, on one side of the hill, you're seeing a lot of trees on the other side, mostly just grasses, maybe some little shrubs or wildflowers. And so that's because we have East to west, um, on the east side, when the sun's rising, it's generally a cooler air temperature. There's maybe some dew on the ground, and the plants are going to have a little, uh, maybe gentler of uh, an effect from the heat. Um, and then when you get to the west side, as it's kind of going into you know the other side, it's setting, and the air temperatures are now warm, and the afternoon has had a lot of time to really like bake the soil and the plants. So the west side tends to be hot and the east side tends to be cooler. All right. And then the same goes for the south versus the north. So as we know, the south um, is where our you know, sun tracks along because we're in the northern hemisphere. So um, as the sun tracks along the southern sky, it's pretty much going to stay. If you have a if you have a big hill, it's going to stay on the south side. So that south side is going to be warmer and drier continuously sort of throughout the year. So we just discussed uh, soils which impact uh, water availability as well as the sun exposure. Um, and here we've created a map. This is something you all could create as well if you wanted to. So in this picture here, we're trying to determine what are the sort of zones that we're working within. And so this area here in the yellow um, is dry and sunny. Area here in the orange has some shade um, and is drier. And it's shady mostly because there's some trees down on that lower edge of the picture there. And then along the water, we expect it to be wet because it's sort of that mixed, uh, sometimes it fills up with water, sometimes it drains out, um, but that area is also sunny because it doesn't have any coverage. So you can make a map similar to this. If you go to King County IMAP, 
um, you can just type that into Google and find your property on that map. And then you can even draw shapes and measure the space of things to get a good estimate of how many uh, you know, plants you might need for a project and things of that nature. So next we're gonna just jump right into plants. We've got a lot of different plants. All of the plants you're seeing here today are gonna be offered at our uh, native plant sale that opens on November 15th. And so uh, as you're looking through these, you know, sort of see, see what might pique your interest. So we're gonna start here with uh, Grand Fur. So Grand Fur can grow to be 300 feet tall and is one of our fastest growing conifers. It has an upright trunk and cones that stand straight up on their branch, which is a little different. And this uh, tree actually supports 124 different butterfly and moth species in their caterpillar state. And so it's, it's a really important species as well as a lot of our trees actually support a, a much higher quantity of, of butterflies and moths than, than say a little ground cover might. And so grand fir likes sun to part shade and soils that are well-drained but moist. Next here, we've got a Western red cedar. It's a beautiful conifer with drooping branches that hang kind of like a skirt and it's disease resistant bark that is kind of a beautiful red to grayish color. They grow to be an average of about 150 feet tall, but you can find them much taller. And they are used by 45 different butterfly and moth species in their larval state, making them a wonderful tree for attracting birds. So we're not just attracting caterpillars, we're attracting birds to eat those caterpillars. Next here, we've got a shore pine. So shore pines uh, typically grow to be 40 to 50 feet tall, which makes them one of our smallest native conifer options. They can grow in a really interesting shape when they're grown near the coast due to wind and salt spray. They can grow kind of wonky, um, which is actually in their name, Pinus contorta. So kind of a contorted growth. Um, they are a very important species for many animals in Washington because they have nutritious, oily seeds. Many small animals, including chipmunks, squirrels, and many birds eat them. And the pine needles are also a favorite material for making nests. So larger pine trees are a great place for roosting and nesting, while a smaller pine tree might provide good cover for animals. Next here, we've got Gary Oak, which is also known as an Oregon white oak. It's a deciduous tree growing to be around 80 feet tall. It has sort of gnarled shape, um, rounded, lobed leaves, and acorns that provide food for wildlife, like the western gray squirrel, which is considered a threatened species. They like well-drained soils and full to part sun. And oaks support a huge variety of native insects along with pines and are considered one of the most important species in Washington for wildlife. Next here, we've got a Pacific Madrone. So Pacific Madrone is a really beautiful tree. I feel like it's very iconic for this area. Um, and it reaches about 40 feet tall. Uh, it has bark that's sort of a cinnamon color and will peel off, revealing a smooth greenish yellow colored bark um, that becomes more orange or red in color over time. The flowers attract many pollinator species and the berries ripen in the early fall and stay on through December, making them a valuable food source when fewer things are available to eat. Madrones like well-drained uh, and drier soil. So when I'm talking about well-drained, I'm talking about soil that doesn't retain a ton of moisture, like you wouldn't be sitting in a puddle. Pacific Madrone does not like sitting in a puddle. It likes sitting in gravel. Next here, we've got Cascara. So Cascara is a deciduous tree with deeply veined leaves. 
that produce a really beautiful fall color. Um, insect eating species are attracted to cascara, like kinglets, chickadees, and nuthatches. And ye the yellow to red berries become this sort of black color when they're ripe and attract many more birds, including grossnecks, stellar jays, robins, and tanagers. So this is a great tree for birds if you want to see them. And I will mention, though, that the berries are not palatable by humans and have a laxative effect. So you'll, you can leave them for the birds and they will enjoy that. They grow in full sun to partial shade and in moist, uncompacted soils. So next here, we have our last tree that we're gonna feature. It's kind of a tree, kind of a shrub, depends who you talk to. So vine maples in my eyes are a small tree. They only get to be like 12 to maybe 25 feet tall if they're in their best conditions, which makes them really great for sort of a backyard setting, like a garden. Um, they prefer moist soils and generally mixed sun and shade. In fall, their leaves become a vibrant orange and red. And the more sun it gets, the redder the leaves become. Although they don't like to be in direct sun. So don't plant them in an open field and hope that they're just going to be really beautiful and red. They might just toast. They also produce little red and white flowers, which are a favorite of native bees. And more than 125 butterfly and moths use this as a host plant for their caterpillars. So next we're gonna be getting into the shrubs. Um, some of these are still pretty big plants, but they are considered shrubs now because of that multi-stemmed look. Um, so red osier dogwood is what we're gonna start with. And it generally prefers moist to wet soil, but can grow in some drier spots as well. It has clusters of small flowers, which is a bit unlike most of the dogwoods um, that you may know. And their berries can hang on into the winter. So they've got these white berries here uh, to attract thrushes, robins, varios, and warblers. Um, on newer growth, the stems are this bright red color and can add very beautiful color to the garden during the winter when the leaves drop off. They provide extremely valuable winter browsing for elk and deer. And once they're established, you can take cuttings. Um, so cut off a piece of it, stick it in the ground to spread this plant into new areas. And it'll actually grow from just being staked into the ground. Next here, we have twinberry. Um, so twinberry is another species that can be grown from cuttings or if a branch kind of droops down to the ground and comes in contact with the soil for long enough, it will sprout roots. Uh, the flowers attract many pollinators and hummingbirds like our native Rufus hummingbird, uh, which feeds on the nectar. This uh, this plant is called twinberry because its berries grow in little pairs like you see here. And although the berries are not for humans, they are great for birds. Next here, we have one of my absolute favorites. So this is thimbleberry. Um, it has no thorns. It has very soft leaves and it has very tasty berries. Uh, that can fit on the end of your thumb like a thimble, which is how it got its name. Native pollinators enjoy the white flowers and birds will enjoy the berries, but you may want to beat them to it so that you get a chance to enjoy them because they are really delicious. And this species can spread a bit from where you planted it over time, but the stalks that shoot up new are pretty flexible and easy to cut if you want to keep it in its spot. Here we have red elderberry. So red elderberry is a shrub to a small tree. You can kind of classify it as either depending on sort of how it's pruned. Um, and so it prefers moist and shady areas and produces red berries that were once a very important staple food for Pacific Northwest peoples. 
Um, however, the berries can cause nausea when raw, so it's important to cook them or ferment them uh, if, if you're hoping to eat them. And it's also a favorite for hummingbirds. So our plant cell actually also sells blue elderberry, which is more typically found on the east side of the Cascades, but was brought to the west side during trade. Um, and the blue elderberries are great for a sunnier, drier site, um, and then have a beautiful blue berry instead of this bright red. Next here, we have salmon berry. So salmon berry is a shrub that does well in moist soils and partial shade. They grow uh, these like really pretty small uh, magenta colored flowers, uh, which are great for many types of pollinators, including beetles, which are actually wonderful pollinators as well, even, even if they maybe give you a little heebie-jeebies when you look at them. Uh, the berries produced are attractive, uh, for for many species of animals as well as people. So people love to make pies and jams out of them, um, add a little sugar and they're pretty good just on their own. Not my favorite, but I'm sure others have their own opinions. Uh, so the salmonberry can kind of spread over time. And so it's important to plant it somewhere where it has some space to spread if, if possible. Next here, we have Pacific Nine Bark. So Pacific Nine Bark uh, can survive in wet or moist areas, but does not like to dry out totally. This plant has beautiful white and pink blooms that become pink seed pods. Um, and add a bit of beauty to your garden and are a valuable resource for wildlife for extended periods of time. The plant is called nine bark because of its unique peeling bark that people believed grew in nine layers. So it's an easy one to remember the name of when you look up close and it's kind of peeling off and showing a bunch of different colors there. Next here, we have oso berry. Uh, and this is, this is the plant that gives me hope each year. So oso berry, will get flowers as early as February. So when you see it start to have flowers, you go, okay, thank, thank goodness it's almost time for spring. We're, we're getting close. Um, and so it, it has these beautiful flowers. Uh, they're kind of dainty, tiny little, little chandeliers of flowers. Um, and and they're, they're a great resource for things like bumblebees that are kind of waking up early in the season when there aren't a lot of other flowers for them to go and seek out. And so this plant also creates these edible berries. They look like like a plum. And so birds like waxwings and robins love to eat these. And um the one thing to note though is in order for it to grow these berries uh, you, it will require that you have both a male and a female plant. And so females grow these berries and it has to be pollinated by a, a male plant in order to, to grow them. Next here, we have another one of my favorites and I'm sure you can see why it's really beautiful. Um, red flowering currant, it likes sun to partial shade and dry to moist soils that are well-drained. Uh, the flowers, are really beautiful, bright pink, um, and attract pollinators, especially hummingbirds. So if you have this in your garden, you might see some hummingbirds more often. Uh, the berries are edible, but pretty unpalatable, um, pretty seedy and kind of gritty. Um, and however, you know, wildlife really does enjoy those berries. Um, and this is one of our, definitely one of our showier native species. Here we have mock orange. So mock orange likes dry, rockier soils and partial sun. The flowers are a huge draw because they are very fragrant and great for pollinators. Juncos, thrushes, and chickadees, grosbeaks, and Finches all use them for shelter and for food. 
here we have tall Oregon grape, uh, which is one of our few evergreen shrubs in Western Washington. It has a very glossy leaf that look very similar to a holly leaf. They grow bright yellow flowers like you see here. And they those flowers will become these sort of dusty colored blueberries. So next here, we have ocean spray. And ocean spray is a shrub that grows in dry to moist soils and in sun to shade. The flowers, which typically bloom in June, are a cream color and can look a bit like sea foam, like kind of crashing waves. And um, the plant actually kind of grows in that formation too, sort of arching up and then curving back down toward the ground. Um, and these flowers produce a sort of brick colored seed that will hold on for much of the year, making them a helpful resource for many birds during the during the winter months. Next here, we've got Nutka Rose, which can grow to be about nine feet tall. It's a pretty big rose. It spreads rhizominously, meaning that it will grow shoots underground from the original plant that spread out and then start a new plant. And so um, it's really good at sort of spreading quickly and sort of taking over an area. So, you know, if you're trying to fight something like blackberry or something like that, it can be nice to have something take over the area. If you're trying to put it in a garden, a smaller setting, it can be a little bit of a challenge to handle. But the roses are these large pink, flowers that act as like a bumblebee landing pad and attract many other pollinators as well. And the rose hips remain on the stems uh, during the winter and can provide a nice pop of color for your winter landscape. Next year, we've got Washington State flower, the Pacific rhododendron, um, which has these beautiful pink flowers and evergreen leaves, making them a wonderful plant for landscaping. I'm sure you've seen them in many people's landscapes but they actually are native, some of them. Um, and they are a plant that enjoys moist, acidic soil that is well-drained and partial shade to full sun. They grow to be up to 25 feet tall. So I've seen them look a lot like a tree and it's pretty spectacular, um, but you'll usually see them closer to like six, seven, eight, nine feet tall. Um, when they're kind of grown out in somebody's yard, at least. Uh, and they're very slow growing, but they're, they're worth the wait. Next year, we have one of our smaller shrub options, actually. This is snowberry, and it likes dry to moist soil with moderate sun. Uh, individual leaves can have very different shapes from one another, which makes them pretty interesting plant to look at. So some leaves kind of have like an oak shape while others are more like a little rounded um, rounded leaf and they can be on the same plant, on the same branch right next to each other. So it's pretty interesting to, to take a, a close look at them and see how different they are just within a single plant. And these have these cute little pink flowers um, that turn into those white berries. I think they look a lot like popcorn on a stem during the winter time. Um, and those berries will stick around throughout the winter. They are not an initial favorite of our birds and other wildlife. However, late in the winter, these berries are still on and those birds are starting to get hungry. So they're willing to take something that was maybe a little less tasty um, and once it freezes, it's actually more digestible. So they wait long enough, then it's easier for them to, to eat. Next here, we have evergreen huckleberry, which is another evergreen shrub, as the name might show you. Um, it grows these cute little pink flowers uh, that turn into berries that will ripen during August or September, so pretty late in the year. And they attract many birds and mammals and are a favorite for people who enjoy eating them straight off the bush or to make jams, pies, or syrup. That sounds pretty great. It's, it's beautiful year round and, and tasty. 
All right, next here, we're going on kind of an evergreen uh, sort of theme here. So uh, next here we have low Oregon grape, which is another evergreen species. Um, it stays fairly small, growing to be around two feet tall. It has a thick prickly leaves um, that have a, a duller sheen than the tall Oregon grape we were looking at earlier. Um, it still has those bright yellow flowers that emerge sort of from the center of, of their leaves. Um, and then those will turn into those pretty blue kind of dusty colored berries you see there. And the flowers are frequently visited by Anna's hummingbirds, which is another native hummingbird species. And unlike many species, it can live in a drier soil and in the shade. So next here, we've got Salal. Uh, Salal is a small shrub with a sort of egg-shaped evergreen leaf, uh, pink flowers, and then produce these droop-like berries. They are pretty good with sunny or shady conditions, although the height of the plant might vary depending on sort of how much sunlight it's getting and how much water it's getting. But it is a common understory species in Western Washington forests, and the berries are sweet and can be used for jams or pies. All right, so now we're into our sort of ground cover uh, section. So the first ground cover we're gonna go over is kinikinik. It's a fun word to say, and it's a challenge to spell, um, but is another evergreen plant. It's a trailing ground cover that can form sort of thick mats, although it's still sort of woody in nature. The stems are sort of woody. Um, and it likes sandy, well-drained soils and can cascade sort of over a rock wall, which is quite pretty. Uh, the berries are edible, but are a bit mealy, uh, a little bland. I've heard some people really like them, but eh, not my favorite. Uh, and they ripen late in the season and can stay on the plant throughout the winter, which makes them look kind of, I don't know, festive. They got little, little red and green in your yard. Um, and I've actually seen this as a complete yard, like grass substitute. So their entire yard was covered in this and it was beautiful. Deer ferns have a more delicate appearance and they have the rounded edges. Um, as opposed to the sword ferns, um, they grow to be about two feet wide and a foot tall, as opposed to a sword fern, which is much larger than that. Um, and they actually have two types of fronds. So they have sterile fronds, which you see sort of in this picture on the right side, the ones that are laying closer to the ground. Um, and then they have furl fronds, which tend to stand straight up and might be a little more narrow. And sort of as their name suggests, uh, they're enjoyed by elk and deer, um, and they grow in moist areas with partial to full shade. Next here we have probably my favorite ground cover. So this one is redwood sorrel. Redwood sorrel uh, spreads out across the ground, sort of blanketing it in this really plush green carpet. Um, and it has these small white to pinkish flowers and heart-shaped leaves. And if you're looking for something that can survive sort of under the evergreen canopy, this may be a good option because it can handle dry to moist soil, shade, and acidic soils. So usually under like a, like a cedar or anything that kind of drops needles, the soil is going to be more acidic and these can handle it. All right, next here we've got sword ferns. We kind of touched on this when we were talking about deer fern, but uh, sword ferns are a very popular Pacific Northwest sort of plant. They, they give the vibe of a Pacific Northwest forest. Um, they grow to be around four feet wide, so double the size of a deer fern. And they enjoy living in moist to dry soils and partial to full shade. Um, and you can leave the fronds as they die back at the base, sort of around the bottom, because they're free mulch. 
They help retain water and suppress weeds, and they also make great habitat. Those down fronds that have kind of died and created a layer around the base, they do a great job of creating habitat for our native salamanders, uh, like the Western redback salamander. Um, and the roots of sword ferns are also fantastic for erosion control because they're very fibrous and they reach deep into the soil, like a few feet into the soil. And that's much more than most things you would consider kind of ground covers to reach. And I think maybe this is our last species. We're counting as a ground cover only for simplicity's sake, it can climb. So this is orange honeysuckle. Orange honeysuckle can crawl across the ground if it has no support. Um, or it can climb up a fence or a tree, um, and each vine can get up to 20 feet long. And then they have these really beautiful kind of trumpet-shaped flowers that are bright orange and a really interestingly shaped leaf. I, I might be the only one that notices the shape of leaves, but this one's really cool. It kind of forms a cup at the base of the flower, and it envelops the entire stem. So you can kind of see that on the pictures um, in the bottom left corner and on the right, they kind of under each flower create like a little, a little cup, which is pretty cool. Um, and hummingbirds really enjoy these flowers. They're the perfect shape for that long skinny beak. Um, and so they will in, invite those hummingbirds into your yard. One thing that's really important to know is that hummingbirds actually eat a lot of insects. I think 80% of their diet is actually insects. So inviting insects into your yard with, with native plants is, is as important for our hummingbird populations as just having all of these nectar, you know, plants available. So next we're going to go into uh, plant stock types. So you looked at all of your sort of plant options. That's not everything we have at our sale. Um, we have quite a few more species if you're interested, but for the sake of time, we had to wrap it up. Um, and so we're going to go into plant stock types. This includes um, potted materials or ball and burlap if you're thinking of a larger tree. Um, and then live stakes, which are on this sort of <laughs> right side of the screen. They just look like sticks. Um, and then bare root trees or plugs. So here we'll start with potted plants. And so potted plants, we're just going to go over the pros and the cons of each category. Um, and so the pros of using potted plants is that they have the best survival rate. Um, they're available pretty much everywhere. You can go to Home Depot or you can get some at Costco or you can go, you know, you can go a lot of different places and find potted material. And they're also pretty hardy. So you can, you know, pick up your plant and just kind of keep them in the pot for quite a while before you're ready to go um, and they'll survive. Some of the cons of potted plants is that they are the most expensive option. Usually a one to two gallon pot can be $15 or more. Um, although you could get them a bit cheaper if you're looking for a, a large amount and you go to a wholesale nursery. Um, the potting soil is different from the native soil, which can cause, if, if not planted quite properly, it can cause the plant to just kind of stay wrapping around in that nice, super fertile soil that you may have put it in um, and, and make it a little less willing to explore the outside world. And then this block here that you see of plants is actually 100 plants. And so if you needed thousands of these, hundreds of these, they'd be pretty hard to transport. You need a truck to get them all where they're going. So that can be another issue. Next year, we've got live stakes. So live stakes um, can be, live stakes can be cut. Um, like we were talking about earlier, dogwood, willows, cottonwoods, black twinberry, or even um, like Douglas spirea do a pretty good job of growing from just a cutting. 
So the pros for live stakes is that they can do really well in a very wet site or an area that's densely covered in an invasive grass, like reed canary grass. Uh, there's the potential for you to harvest from on site uh, or up, you know, a nearby, like a friend's property to save money. Um, and to have you have the most local genetic pool possible. Um, they're easy to transport, like carrying around, you know, a stick. Um, and they're kind of fun to harvest. And then you've got good soil. They're pretty fun to put in because you just kind of push, push them into the ground halfway in, halfway out, and, and they'll do pretty well. Um, some of the cons for live stakes uh, is that there's limited species that can do well. The ones mentioned here do the best. Uh, they have a higher mortality rate and they have very little growth in the first year. So this picture I have here shows them in the first year. And then this plant here in the center is actually a live stake, but it's been growing for about three years now. So it took a little while to get it to become like that one. And then lastly, we have um, bare root plants and plugs. So bare roots are grown in a field, much like a food crop, um, you know, like rows and rows of, of these native plants out in a field. And then when the plants go dormant in the winter, they're lifted out of the ground with a machine, like, it kind of strips away their, their soils and then they're put into a cooler to stay dormant um, until they're ready for planting. And then plugs are grown in an extremely small container, as you can see here, um, and they're very young plants. So the pros of bare root and plug species is that they're typically the cheapest option, usually around a dollar to two dollars for one plant. Um, they have an ability to adapt to native soils a bit better because they don't come with any soil. It's like throwing them into the deep end. They got to figure it out, right? They can't coil inside of that beautiful nursery soil. Um, and they're easy to transport. So a lot of people will think like, I need to bring a truck. I need to bring a U-Haul. Um, but no, mostly you can fit like a few hundred plants in the trunk of like a Prius. So that's, that's a pretty cool feature. Um, very transportable. Um, one of the cons is that there's a very narrow planting window. So generally you can't get them before January because they need to be dormant and harvested. Um, and they need to be planted um, by April or so. And then there's limited suppliers. So you really can't find these easily um, for sale to the public. So um, KCD's plant sale is one of the options for uh, you to get your hands on, on bare root plants. Uh, they require a bit more attention when you're planting them to make sure all of the pieces are hanging the right way and they're not going to shoot back out um, of their hole. And there's a bit of precaution that needs to be used to prevent the roots from drying out. So there is potential for a higher mortality rate. So like I talked about before, there's kind of different planting windows uh, for each type of stock. So containers have the largest planting window from October to the end of March. And stakes can generally be put in from November to March. Um, and then bare roots are harvested in the winter and can can be planted until the end of March, maybe April if it's rainy. You want the plants to be, well, you want it to be rainy and you want the plants to be dormant. And so that's kind of how they figure these different windows. Our main goal is to allow the plants to get their roots established before the stress of summer can take its toll. So like I mentioned a few times now, uh, King Conservation District has a native plant sale and orders are going to start being taken um, 8 a.m. on November 15th. So if you're interested and you're looking for plant material, then this is a great option. 
Um, some things will sell out pretty early that first day or so. Certain certain cuter, showier species uh, tend tend to sell out pretty pretty quickly on that first day. But uh, we have many many plants, and so it's good to take a look. Um, those plants will place because they are bare root plants, you'll place your order now, but you won't pick up until March 2nd or 3rd. Um, and so that allows them to have time to be harvested while, while dormant. Um, and in this picture, you can kind of see what some of those different plants look like. They're, they're often quite small or look like sticks, um, but they turn into something beautiful within a year to two years. 